so much on the past and the things that have happened to them before, a lot of times the, the human emotion of knowing what happened is what causes us to treat the dog slightly differently, which causes them to revert to a lot of these behavioral issues. And there's obviously a lot that goes into this kind of stuff uh, past just that, obviously. Um, but the, the training approach doesn't typically change depending on the dog that we're working with. And you know, any use of the e-collar with any dog that we're doing, we're trying to make sure it's done in a fair way to the dog, obviously. We're not trying to like overuse anything with them. Uh, we're trying to just get them understanding clearly what it is we need them to do obviously and like you were saying you know understanding that there's rewards as well as consequences for behavior because you know unfortunately the dog right now is showing that like you were saying he knows a lot of the things that you're asking him to do but there's no accountability as far as you know when he doesn't want to do those things us having any sort of ability to get him to still do those things and that's where the safety kind of comes into play of some of the issues you're experiencing so yeah, I mean, there's, again, a lot of variables to this. You know, when it comes to reactivity and socialization related things, typically speaking, when it comes to the actual interactions with other people and other dogs and stuff like that, that's actually much less of like a training thing. And that's more of you guys just understanding how to properly introduce him, you know, and how to put in place proper safety protocols. And more than anything, what places are going to be appropriate to socialize him in and what places are going to be inappropriate to socialize him in. Because I think a lot of the problem we'll find in cases like this, that dogs that are developing really serious reactivity or aggression issues towards people or dogs or kids, whatever it may be, like 75% of the ways that we're currently trying to socialize them or the dog is winding up socializing with people are just completely not conducive to proper socialization and it causes them to continuously regress. And then some people, as opposed to addressing the root of the problem, which is that the dog is just being put in bad situations, some people will resort to just using like punishment and trying to correct away the behavior and stuff like that, where you're kind of just fighting an uphill battle then at that point, you know? Um, so a lot of this is educating you on the, on the proper way to do this kind of stuff. From there, as far as compliance of commands and things like that, you know, regardless of if the dog is doing it because they're scared or not scared or this or that, it, it kind of is, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, like semantics at that point, right? Like I always say, like, you know, are you not speeding in your car because you're scared of getting a ticket or just because you understand there's a consequence for it, right? Like you could probably argue it both ways, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, am, am I scared of potential consequences for my behavior? Sometimes, right? But it's not debilitating, right? If it's consistent and it's clear and it's fair, it's not like it's this like deep trauma that I have, but I definitely don't want the consequence to happen still, you know? Um, so, so, you know, in their brain, they're kind of processing those things similarly. So, so I, I get, I get, I get where you're coming from with it. Unfortunately, we don't really do it that way for a lot of reasons. One of the biggest ones being obviously training is such a, a long process. And like, especially when you get into like behavioral modification with dogs, there's so many ups and downs through the process that if you're kind of judging the experience in some cases based on one or two sessions and the results that you're kind of at post that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a fair assessment of what the training is actually going to provide. You know what I mean? So we really just try to recommend and people do as much research on what we do, how we do it, watch our YouTube videos, listen to our podcast, all that kind of stuff, and really kind of trust that process going into it and just fully commit because that's really the only way you're going to get really, really great success with it. Not that I, I get what you're saying. I know it's not that you're not committed to it, um, but but that's the reason why we don't we don't typically do things that way. Good. All right, so we're uh, we're helping T out with some crate training here. He's never really been too good in the crate. Great. The first thing what we want to do is kind of associate this with a little bit of structure as opposed to something that's going to predict um, abandonment. Okay. So that he can kind of think of this a little bit differently. Great. So first things first, I need to get him in on command. That's the only requirement for right now. And eventually we'll start to tighten that up. Okay. But in general, formal crate training 
crate is defined as does the dog go into the crate on command? And once the door opens, does he wait for the okay before exiting? And then in general, in the crate, some uh, good rules of thumb are no barking, no pawing at the doors, no scratching, anything like that. Crate. Just in general, the crate should be something that encourages relaxation. Okay. Come on, buddy. I know. You're happy. Crate. Good. Crate. So now that I've got the verbal command nice and smooth, okay, I'm going to start to require that he stay in until I release him. Crate. So initially I'm going to start to use spatial pressure just to kind of help him out before I start to use corrections. Good. Okay. Great. Good. As long as he's committed, I'll give him the okay. Okay. Good boy. Get off me, butthead. Great. Good. Very nice. Okay. Good boy. Yeah, good boy. You're handsome. You get off of me. You're a total boxer. Great. Okay. So now that he seems to kind of understand that he needs to wait, now I'm going to start to use corrections. Great. So what I'm waiting for at this point, since I haven't released him, is for one paw to make contact with the ground. I'm gonna mark that with a no and just tap. And I'm not too high on a level. He just learned this, so I don't want it to be too punitive. Okay, looking good, bud. Great. And I'll start to add a little bit more duration to the waiting portion of it. No. Great. Boy. Great. Good. So a little bit more duration. A little more distance. Okay. Next, what I'm going to add is a little motion. Great. Don't let him get all the way settled in there. Now I'm going to start to add a little motion. No. Great. We'll try that again there, Mr. T. Okay. Boy. Great. Good. Once he's settled, I'll add my motion. Okay. Last one, and then we'll add the door in. Great. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. All right, we're gonna add the door in now. Make it a little more realistic here. Great. Good. All right, close that door. Walk away for a second. Now we'll give him that same look, but with the door opening. And of course, the instinct is to bolt out of the door when it opens, so we'll be watching for that. No. Great. We will try again. Okay. Good boy. Come on. 
film here. You gotta get his face when I open this door. <laughs> that is the face of concentration. And he looks pretty happy to work, doesn't he? Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Today what we're going to do is we're going to be teaching the bed command here. Um, this will be what you start working on in the house with him, obviously. And this is with the leash. Yeah, we're going to be adding the e-collar in and the verbal command. Um, so yeah, we're going to be introducing the bed command here. This is going to be what you're using in the house and like when guests come over and stuff like that. So um, similar process to what we did last time. I'm just going to be teaching it with the verbal command and the leash first. Bed. I'll tell him bed, obviously. If I need to, I'll help him up on. Good. Okay. I'll do that a few times, kind of prime them up for what we're about to do. Bed. Good. Okay. Bed. Good. Okay. We'll do two more like that. Okay. Bed. Bed. Nice. Okay. Bed. Good. Okay. All right, next we're gonna start layering some e-collar pressure into this. So I'll walk him up to the bed. Bed, give that command. And if he does not do it, I'm gonna engage the e-collar, help him on, and then release it the second he gets on. Okay. So you hold it down? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're essentially teaching him where that pressure turns off in the case of this command. Yep. Bed. Good, and if he does it on his own, obviously nothing. Okay. So there's two main ways you could use the e-collar, right? So you could use it as we refer to as negative reinforcement, which is what we're doing right now. That means we're applying pressure and then releasing pressure to reinforce something, right? Um, that would be used to teach a command. Like in this case, he doesn't really know the bed command yet, so we're gonna use that to help increase the likelihood of like, we want you to get on the bed. That's the good spot, right? The other way to use it is as positive punishment, which is how we were using it last time, which is we could take something that he knows how to do, right? I could tell him to sit, and if he doesn't sit, since I know he knows that command, I could give a single correction to deter him not sitting, right? So if we're working on a new command with him, typically we're gonna start with that negative reinforcement. Um, if we're working on a command that he already knows, that's where we're gonna switch to that positive punishment or that single tap. Come on. Bed. Good. Okay. What level is the... We're starting now. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah. 
You know, if he beats you to it, just try to say bed right before he gets onto it. We're kind of using the repetitions to our advantage of kind of getting him into that autopilot mode so he's successful, you know? If you look at like most of our commands, they're kind of visual pictures to the dog, right? So yes, we need to say the command to get him to do it, but he's also learning this picture of me being near the bed means get on the bed, right? And we just kind of use that to our advantage because this is just, this is functional obedience training, right? We're not training a competition dog. We want to set things up for him to be successful. Okay. Actually, let me see him one time real quick here. Let's take that. Okay. Here, bud. So with those, like anytime you're doing this with the sits or the beds or anything like that, bed. Usually the easiest way to do it is to make this leash as like nonchalant as possible. If we're like all over the place yeah. like this, that could be really kind of off-putting to him and kind of spook him almost. So I'll usually just hold the handle, get it in like a nice arc like that, and then I'll just arc around where I can guarantee there's no tension on it. And it's not like getting in his face and right. stuff, you know? <clears throat> And that's going to be as easy as possible for him there, as opposed to, like I said, all over the place with it. Thank you. Okay, so next what I'm going to do here, come here, bud, is we're going to start kind of combining both of the commands we've worked on so far a little bit. So I'm going to do a bed stay, then a sit stay, and I'm going to alternate back and forth between the two a few times here, just kind of testing them a little bit. Bed. So we'll start with the bed command, obviously. Have him hold that. So I use my bed stay, like if you were to come to my house, as soon as you knock on that door, I put my dogs into a bed stay, let you guys in, and I would have my dogs hold that bed stay for about 10 to 15 minutes as a way to kind of let everybody get in, get situated, let my dogs kind of acclimate to those people from afar a little bit. From there, I could release them and let them be a part of things. And by establishing that routine and that control right off the rip, you eliminate 99% of issues that you'll have with guests. Come on. So now I'll find a spot and do a sit stay here. Sit. Good. In some dog's cases, um, you know, like in his case, because he's really apprehensive of new people, the next couple of times people come over the house, he may be in a bed stay for the majority of the time that they're there. You know what I mean? Uh, until he starts to really kind of chill out and get used to being around them. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we'll get more into as we move along, um, you know, the process of introducing guests and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's going to be like your number one tool for helping work through those issues. Yeah, it's just, it doesn't accomplish anything. Like obviously we have to manage him, right? Like, so I understand, you know, putting him in another room, putting him in the crate, something like that is, is what you guys can do right now. But the bed stay is like basically the equivalent of doing that, but getting him thinking and having him still be a part of things. No. Sit. Tried to sneak away. What do you mean by that? Like, like what else do you want to work on? I kind of want to work on. Well, the thing I feel like we're really lacking with is a lot of like engagement. Okay. Um, like he'll do his sits, he'll do his down, he'll do his beds, you know, he'll do heels and everything. But the big reward for him is the release. Like mm -hmm. he's a care owner. I can have chicken. I can have cheese whiz. I can have. You know, like yeah. gross, smelly sausage. Like, he doesn't care about any sort of food. He doesn't care about toys. He doesn't mm -hmm. care about praise or love or whatever. The release is like what is his biggest reward and kind of what he works for. Sure. Uh, so, I kind of really want to work on a lot of um, engagement with him and kind of work on more like advanced obedience. We do a lot of um, going to bars and going to restaurants and going to dog events. Yep. Um, like, he's a go everywhere, do everything with dog. Yep. He does a ton of off. Stuff. Sure. He's a big off leash dog. I really just want to kind of prove him and see if there's anything else they can do with him or kind of like yeah. You know, the intermediate steps are, you know? So, so here's my question, right? We get, like I said, we can work on whatever you want to work on. That's fine. Where's the problem, though? Because, like, in, when somebody tells me, like, because you're not the first person, obviously, you know, like, they want to work on engagement, right? The, the big thing I ask is, like, if we're not having any issues with compliance out of the dog, like, what do you, where's, you know, what's the goal, right? So he's kind of, like, at the point where he's listening to what he's doing. He doesn't want to learn anymore. What do you want him to learn? I just want to keep, yeah, that's the problem. I, just, <laughs> I like working with him. I 
understand. That's yeah. cool. Hey, listen, I'm into that. That's that's awesome, obviously. But what you know, like, what's we gotta have a we gotta have like a north star here. Yeah. You know what I mean? We gotta have a target as far as this is what we're striving for. Yeah. I'm, right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. <clears throat> oh, I see all these people doing all this fun stuff with like rally and sure. Turkey, you know, you know. Listen, that yeah. would be you know that that's I mean, targets, he's obviously. Doing stuff like tricks. He just. Yep. I got you. Okay. I don't know if it's, it's fine, you know. Yeah. Well, those are that's we're we're moving in the right direction here, right? So like you you brought up obviously rally obedience, you brought up trick training, stuff like that. Are those things you want to be able to do? Like, are those things you want to be able to do? Yeah, but I guess like my main thing is like, is that going to hinder him in any way? Like for me, like pushing him towards learning that stuff. Like, should I just be satisfied with him being a relatively good dog? You know. It. No, I mean, listen, I mean, you could take training as far as you want to go with it, right? And I'm not really a believer that, like, any type of training you do with him is going to ruin your other training that you have because that's, like, that's looking at it like they're two separate things. Like, training is training, right? The only time that we'll see certain things get in the way of other things is actually when you work the other way around, right? So what I mean by that is let's say somebody did rally obedience with their dog, or AK, bless you. So that was loud. <laughs> Uh, rally obedience or AKC obedience or something like that, right? And they did a primarily like reward-based system with things and the dog was doing really great with all of that. And then they went in and they did like e-collar work and they did prong collar work and they were like getting really firm with corrections and this and that. That can kind of hinder your dog's like enthusiasm for the training a little bit if done improperly, you know what I mean? But if we're taking a dog that it's like, okay, cool, this dog has had a balanced training approach. If the dog isn't super food motivated, probably was primarily like escape training, avoidance training, stuff like that with the e-collar and stuff, which is fine. Uh, obviously, we do that here as well. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. Um, and now we want to work on developing some further communication and motivation and stuff like that so that we could do more like that. That's completely fine. And as long as you're still consistent about enforcing the criteria of your commands, that's not really going to mess anything up. Yeah. But again, you get into... I, I always get into why are we doing the things that we're doing? That's why I asked, like I said, like what's the goal? Because like I said, if the goal is you want to start doing rally obedience with him, like hell yeah, let's spend the time um, developing the food drive, the motivation, uh, starting to boost this kind of enthusiasm for the training and stuff like that a little bit, obviously. If your goal is um, you know, to do just trick training as a way where it's like when the weather's crappy out or in the winter, you want to be able to teach him new tricks and stuff like that, like. 100% fine, but if the goal is I want to do those things because I feel like I see people doing those things and like, do I have to do those things? You know what I mean? Like, then then why waste, you know, like why waste your time? Like I, at this point, like listen, like when I first started getting in dog training, like I got into it because I liked competitive obedience, right? Like I used to do Mondial Ring with my my, my Malinois, stuff like that, right? Um, you used to do Mondial Ring? No, no, competitive obedience. Like we were doing rally, so. You were doing rally with him? Yeah, I was doing intro to rally. We had our okay. CGC certification, like all that stuff. And the pandemic hit, and then that was through his fear period. And then I, I, yeah. really don't, I really don't know. You know, he was turning two at that point. Okay. Like, right, like 16, 18 months. And I don't know what happened. Yeah. All, all of a sudden, he was reacting to dogs. Sure, to sure, to sure. Yeah. yeah. People. So we were on that track <clears throat> yeah. for therapy dog training, CGC training, rally obedience, trick training, like our AKC novice trick training. We were on yeah. that track for all of that. So that's fine. Like I said, so 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 like I said, if that's something you want to do, that that's cool. Yeah, then then that's totally fine. So then we need to get into right developing motivation. Right, he currently has no motivation. So first thing I look at is what is our feeding routine with him. Uh, twice a day. More specifically than that. So sometimes I'll feed him like hand feed him with food. Yeah. He usually doesn't want to work for it. Yeah, but I mean like amounts, what kind of food oh, you feed and stuff like that. Time. Two cups total a day, oh, or yeah, once in the okay. morning, once in the evening. It gets soaked in water um, and it gets fish oil in the morning. Okay. Does he fish. eat all of it every time you put it down? 100% mm -hmm. of it? 100% licks the bowl clean. Like, like the second you put that bowl down, he eats it and yeah. it takes him just a minute or so to yeah. eat it, but he won't eat it out of your hand? He will. It's just he's not like excited to do it, you know? Like if I, I definitely have like a higher value reward or something, like he's on those sits, he's on those downs, he's on the spins, he's on his bed stays, that sort of stuff. With, you know, like just his food, he's like, yeah, I'll sit, yeah, I'll down, yeah, I'll mosey on over to the bed and do like a bed stay. There's more enthusiasm with higher values. Yeah. Okay. Well, so then he has food drive. Yeah. Right? Because you said at the beginning he didn't have food drive. Not anywhere outside of the home. Okay. 
So if I ever try to take, like I can take them for a walk, or I can take them to an event, I think I, I'm trying to find that like intermediate, if that makes sense. Like he's got some drive at home. Um, but sometimes like, sometimes it's there. I, I can't understand why. Sometimes it's there, sometimes he wants to do it, sometimes he's just like, I'm not feeling it. I don't know if it's like I'm too close to dinner, too close to breakfast, you know, he's not feeling good that day. Like, yeah. there are dogs around him and he thinks there's a resource, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I don't really understand, but I definitely know I'm going from like home to like crazy outdoors, a bunch of people. Yeah. I'm trying to find like an intermediate, I guess, to work on. Like, if that makes sense, like a, like a dog, like a, a park that only has like a few dogs, or we're just focusing like out, you know, away from the home, then we add the dogs. Yeah, but it's not, life, but, but it sounds like, right, so like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm hearing that like his food drive is just okay at the house. Like he'll take it, yes. but it's not even that great at the house. Right. So then of course, it's not gonna be good anywhere else if it's not even good there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's better with high value stuff. I've got a chicken. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you don't want to be contingent on that though, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so, so really, I mean, you get into this and there's a couple variables as far as why food drive would be lacking, right? So first and foremost, obviously stress, right? Stress impacts food drive. You could have a dog that's ridiculously food driven, right? And if they hit a point where they're too stressed out, they're gonna stop taking the food, they're gonna refuse it, right? So when I'm trying to develop food drive, one of the first things that I do is regardless of how I'm training my dog in day-to-day -day life, I eliminate in my sessions that I'm doing the food drive stuff in, I'm trying to develop it in, I eliminate any corrections to start, right? So no e-collar, no nothing like that, at least to start until we start getting his attitude up with things, right? If we want him to enjoy this, I'm not saying e-collar is ruining his enjoyment of things by any means, right? But you gotta build it from the ground up, right? We have to start with the engagement and the motivation and get him really peppy and really pumped up to do the training. From there, we start adding the corrections in where we really need to add the corrections in, right? So. One thing that you could do right off the rip is for a week, right, each of those meals, you could literally, you don't even need to do training for it initially. You just literally feed them out of hand, yeah, right? Yeah, doot, 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 doot. Because he sometimes like spits food off. I've already talked to them about it. So I usually like, I don't know if it's because he's eating too fast, he's in a slow feeder, but the water seems to like, yeah, I mean, you, there, there's nothing wrong with feeding with water, obviously. It's not yeah. adding any additional calories or anything like that. But like, I'll tell you, like my dogs eat their food really fucking fast and they, every now and then, will start hacking up a couple pieces of kibble and then re-eat them <laughs> and like, yes. it's gross, obviously. But like, yeah, I mean, that, when you have a dog that's really food driven, like that's kind of a part of the game, obviously. So like I said, if you're feeding them out of a bowl, it's fine, but just doing it out of hand, I would just, yeah, just maybe like normal, you know? Yeah, with smaller handfuls. Why don't you give me two of those? <clears throat> when you get into, so back when we were doing more competitive training and stuff like that, you know, there's something that we would teach all the dogs before we'd even start training them, which is basically, they call it an engagement session, right? And you would do an engagement session before you ever went to teach the dog a sole thing, even before you went to go condition in your markers and stuff like that. And literally what an engagement session was, was teaching the dog to turn on and off the attention, right? So like, what's his name again? Sorry. Bo. Bo, okay. So basically what you would do is you would say, Bo, yes. Right? And then all you would do is just start walking around, just feeding him and keeping that engagement on you, right? And I would do this walking around a room, no expectation at all, aside from just follow me around and just eat this food, right? And then at the end of the engagement session, done. Say done, and then he'd be done with it, right? So the reason why we started with something like that as opposed to even like marker charging or a sit command or anything like that is because that is like the most stupidly basic thing that the dog can do. Literally follow me around and eat food out of my hand. You know what I mean? It's as simple as that. And what happens is the dog gets more and more driven and pushy for that food where then you could start incorporating your other things into it from there, right? So yeah, I, I definitely think that right now, though, yes. I think right now, if you're not seeing this drive at home with him with stuff, um, you're probably asking too much out of him or you're being too strict on him over stuff, you know? And you need to probably just loosen it up and just like let him make some mistakes and just let him have fun with it, you know? Conditioning I had gotten when I 
sure. And listen, like I'm by no means saying that that's wrong because like, you know, we train a lot of similar things, you know what I mean, from the standpoint of like when a lot of these dogs go home, especially like you said, he had some fear aggression issues, right, some reactivity issues, things like that. Like, yeah, like trust me, like I'm not worried about food driving the dog like that. You know what I mean? I'm worried about making sure that you have control over him. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like you kind of look at priorities based on the dogs you're working with where we work with stuff from like we do behavioral modification obviously, but then we work with puppies and we work with dogs that are just coming in just to learn some manners and stuff like that. And our program kind of changes depending on the dog we're working with, right? right? Where if I have a dog that comes in that doesn't have any major issues and it's just like, they're just here just to learn, you know what I mean? It's like we can have more fun with the process and we can motivate them more and I can teach the owner to, to develop that good relationship with them based on that kind of stuff, right? But again, if I get a dog that comes in that's like a man eater, right, or is out here trying to kill every dog they see out on the walk, that's all going out the window because I need to make sure, again, you have control over that dog, right? So you just have to be able to, once you've checked that box where it's like, again, it sounds like you're not really having any issues with him, right? No, that, he's, yeah. he's pretty good. Yeah, which is whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah it's not. Yeah. But like all those issues you originally went to training for are good at this point? Yeah, I mean, I really don't have any yep. issues. Yep. I try to snap one person. Sure. I mean, if you try to snap a dog, it's justified. If a dog is Yeah, that's space, different. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I so, don't want to come in that position yeah. to begin So now that you've gotten past that, right, and you've checked that box of I've got control over him, now you could just. Have fun. have fun. You know what I mean? And it's like, let's say we, you know, because this is what I see all the time, right? Is like, you know, when we're at the stage where we're trying to have fun with the dog, we are a little programmed to like, again, we ask, say I'm working him right now, come on, bud. And I say down and good. Let's say he didn't down, right? We're so programmed to no, right? Correct, right? And, and it's like one of those things where it's like, it's not, it's not wrong by any means, right? But if my goal is shifting to, I want him to have more fun with the process, I could start looking at like, was that just like an honest mistake right there? And if I have a motivation that I know he wants right now, that's where you get into your secondary form of punishment. Do you know what that is? Negative punishment, right? So positive punishment is use of the e-collar, right? Which is a effective use of punishment. Yes, withholding of reward, right? If I know my dog really wants the thing that I have for them and I have their attention and I have their engagement and I ask him to down and he doesn't down, right. nope. You're just not getting it right now. And you know, it's, it's interesting, like if you get into like the science of stuff, right? There are scientific studies that show the withholding of reward to dogs that are really, really food motivated is like way, way more aversive on them than the actual correction on the e-collar, yeah. right? So I could implement that into my training and it's gonna be just, it's gonna accomplish the same thing. Right. You know what I mean? So we're just using more quadrants of the learning with the dog, right? So we're enhancing on the communication that we already have with them. And we're then, you know, I talk about training being kind of like an art form, right? Like initially, obviously the mechanics of training, like the use of the food, the use of the e-collar, the use of the prong collar, all that kind of stuff, that all is consistent across the board, right? They can be used in this way, right? But from there, how we implement them and what order we implement them, you know, what quadrants we decide to use to enforce or um, deter certain behaviors, that's where you gotta look at the dog you're working with and be like, what does he need right now? Right. right? And in a lot of cases, if I'm just in my house doing a training session with my dog and I have rewards at hand there, right? Nine out of 10 times, I probably don't need to give like a physical correction for that. You know what I mean? Down. Good. So right here. Nope. Down. Nope. Down. Good. Nope. Down. Good. Okay, right, so I accomplished the same thing, but I didn't need to give a correction, because right there, let's say, he make, he's making mistakes, right? Listen, this is new for him. He's like, oh, we're working for the food, this is fun, this is cool, he wants to pop up and meet me halfway. Let's say right there, I go, no, boom, right, big correction for that. He's gonna be like, well, what the fuck? This isn't fun anymore, <laughs> you know? And then immediately, you start deterring that food drive, right? So yeah, I think a lot of this is gonna be just like taking a step back and just having fun working with him. You know what I mean? Yeah, like kind of broadening the horizons for him as well as yourself. Yeah. Grab more of these. You're getting all the treats here today, bud. Hell yeah. Does that all kind of make sense? Yes. <clears throat> I think I've been really just getting caught up on that. It gets very, very easy to get caught up on the e-collar. And again, I, I elaborate to people, it's nothing about what you've done so far is incorrect. Right. No. 
Good. Even stuff like that, right? Like, listen, like, yeah, I, I probably would have corrected for that with the e collar, but it's like, he wanted the reward, right? So what did I do? I told him no, he got back on the ground, and then I rewarded him for correct behavior. So he realized that doesn't get you this right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> so yeah, like nothing you've done is incorrect or wrong. It's just like when we start broadening our goals as far as like we want him to have more fun with the training, you start kind of shifting what you're implementing a little bit more, right. you know? So his engagement seems pretty good. His food drive seems pretty good. His sit commands seem pretty good. So we're gonna pick a different command. We're gonna work some downs here since he was kind of having issues with popping up out of that position, right? Down. Yeah, I mean, listen, like I'm, I'm all for, you know, people that are in your position wanting to start having more fun with the training, you know? Hell yeah, right? Like that's a, that's a great goal to have because, you know, like I said, initially sometimes there's bigger fish to fry with things, you know, when it comes to like more behavioral issues and stuff like that. But typically, the more fun the dog's having, the more fun we're having, the more we actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, so I think it's, this, is, this is great that you want to be able to do this kind of stuff with them. I just like to isolate like goals, you know what I mean? Because like at this point, like I said, like I've, I've been through all that with my dogs. I've done all that stuff with them. I'm, I'm you know, I don't do that much stuff anymore with them. Like I live this very like holistic, natural approach to my dogs where they just exist in the house, and they hang out and we enjoy each other's company, they run around in the backyard and all that kind of stuff. And like that's what I like doing with them, right? So I don't have a need to do all of this kind of stuff, yeah. right? And yeah, every now and then I'll see videos on YouTube of people that, you know, are doing cool tricks and all this stuff and I'll be like, oh, that looks fun. You know, like I, you know, maybe I should start doing that with Vinny again. Or I posted a video the other day on my personal Instagram from like seven years ago of like, a, I was teaching Vinny this like rewind trick. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I, I watched that video, I was like, oh man, that was cool, you know? Like he, he liked doing that and stuff. But it's like, I just don't have the, the urge to do that kind of stuff with them anymore, you know? And I have plenty of other ways to fulfill them biologically and stuff where I don't need to do all of those types of right. things. So, you know, as long as it's something that you're gonna use and you're gonna need to, you know, in order to, to kind of move him along as far as like getting back into the sport stuff and things like that, then, then I think that's awesome, you know? Um, I think that, it, like I said, when you're doing it, the biggest hurdle that I find people have is, you know, sometimes you can just get too hung up on like the e-collar and the corrections, right. right? As opposed to realizing there are a lot of ways to deter behavior when it comes to teaching things or in order to teach correct and incorrect choices when it comes to teaching things with rewards, right. you know? Listen, I'm not all like positive only this, positive only that, obviously, but it's like, there are definitely, you know, like if you look at positive only trainers, right, they're able to teach a downstay without the use of corrections, right? They're able to teach a bed stay without the use of corrections, right? Is it the most reliable thing in the world? Like probably not, but like you don't need them in order to, to do a lot of this kind of stuff, which is why when people come in, like I said, in your position and they want to start doing some of this more fun stuff with the dog, I usually tell them just like put the e-collar away for a little bit, yeah. you know, just, just have fun working with the dog. Yeah. So, good. Okay. Do one more of those. Come on, buddy. Down. Good. And he's got a precursor because I really want a sport prospect dog. But oh, wait, huh? How can I do that when I still yeah. have so much to learn? Like yeah. The dog I currently have, you know? There's a lot you can get done with your own dogs. Good. From the like, I, I was in the same. Okay, when I first started getting into this, um, I just had Vera, my pity, right? And she, she's got a really great food drive. Like she, better than a lot of dogs, right? But like, she was still limited as far as some of the things she could learn when it came to like, when I was doing ring sport and stuff like that. So like, I really took it about as far as I can get it with her, as far as like teaching of the obedience commands and developing the motivation and teaching complex behaviors and stuff like that. And I hit a point where, like I had learned all the things I needed to learn with her and the things I wanted to continue progressing and doing, I needed to get a different dog to do those yeah. things. You know what I mean? You got so, this, this is really good. You got a lot you can do with this dog, you know? <clears throat> James is typically pretty food driven too, I think too. So, <laughs> so you know, you, you got plenty that you can get done with them. Yeah. Down, good. Yeah. Like he doesn't like water. I'm going to that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, good. Okay, I'll tell you, water's another one though that a lot more dogs than you would imagine are kind of spooked of water initially, and there's some ways you can get past that too. Yeah, he'll, he'll go in it. Yeah. He doesn't enjoy it. Sure. <laughs> like when we do rivers and stuff, 
Down. Good. Yeah, I'm picking a breathing specifically. Okay. So you got a bunch of things that you could do as far as starting here. What I would start with is, because I, I do think he'll be fine for just his kibble, I would pick one meal a day, right? And instead of um, feeding it out of a bowl, feed it during a training session, mm -hmm. right? And I would literally just isolate your couple commands you got. I would do, for the first week, I would do just down. Good, okay, right? I would do downs, I would do bed. Good, okay, right? And then I would do come, good. I would work those three commands, right? If in a couple of days he's super eager to do those, add your duration into your bed stays and your down stays. From there, just ride that out for a week, you know? Just let him have a ton of fun with working those commands for one meal a day, right? Once you have that accomplished and we've checked the box, okay, we could work him now, he enjoys the training, we've got pretty good attention out of him, then you could start making things more challenging, okay. right? And you could pick just one thing you wanna do with him, right? One that I actually recommend for people a lot because I think it's pretty easy to do and it builds on something the dog already knows is sending to the bed from afar, you know? And that may be something you've already done a little bit of with him, but really start challenging it where you like take a line and I used to have people like take like a leash or something like that, put a leash across right here and do five repetitions from here until he does five in a row perfect, right? Then move it two feet back. Then do five from here, do it until it's perfect. Then move it a little further back and kind of keep building on that until you could send him from anywhere in the room, you know? From there, once that's good, it's like, okay, cool. Take that, throw that to the side for a little bit, pick something else, right? right? And that's kind of the key when you're doing a lot of reward-based training initially, is just pick one thing at a time, just let him be really successful with it, you know? Then take something else, then let him be really successful with it. From there, once you got a couple things established that are good, then you start the process of kind of alternating and challenging him a little bit, and doing like a bed send, then calling him to you, then putting him in the heel, right? And you can just start just taking all these commands and like playing around with them a little bit, but just get each one really good one at a time first to reduce the conflict and the stress, right? right? So that you can get really jacked up and eager to do that specific thing, okay. right? And then from there, what I would start looking at, you know, once you have one or two things that you've done pretty successfully, then look at, okay, cool, again, what do I wanna do with him? Say rally obedience, you start looking at the exercises, right? What things does he need to perform, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of different tiers and stuff to it, whether it's his healing, right? You work on really swinging into heel and getting that really, really good with the rewards, right? Whether you work on weaving through poles, you work on the sit stay with the come out of it, you work on a retrieve, right? You pick just some of those exercises and you just start drilling those things, you know? But your first step is just, yeah, you, you need to start developing a good working relationship through this kind of stuff with him, right. if that's what you want to do, Yeah. you know? Yeah. But I'm not seeing a dog that's not motivated at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think if you're not seeing the motivation, it's probably because you're doing something that's just putting a little too much stress yeah, on him. I definitely was, but I don't really know how to, that's what I was conditioned. Yeah, know? no, I understand. So yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I mean, he looks like he's got great drive, you know? So I would start with that. I, I think I would do that, to take three or four weeks and just do that for like three or four weeks, okay. you know? And then just like, let me know, shoot me an email, be like, hey, it's going great. We're having fun with our training sessions. He's enjoying it, he's motivated, you know? Um, and then from there, if there's something else specific that you wanna work on, we can get you in, we can work on that obviously, but uh, hopefully that at least answered some of your questions on where to start with it, yeah. you know? Hey. Oh. Being shut down. Sure. Yeah, and I'm not even, like I said, I wasn't even really seeing a shut down dog necessarily. I was just seeing a dog that like, he's like, I'm in working mode right now, you know? And this isn't fun time. And it's, it's funny because- Hi, dude. I definitely know he does really well when I'm around, but I know sure. when I drop him off, it's a whole different Yeah, what do you mean by that? Like, um, you know, he's coming, I don't know, he's coming in yes. July, it's because I tried several different boarding facilities oh, sure. and he tried to bite people. <laughs> just get stressed out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a difference. You know what I mean? Like, over time, he'll start to develop a good relationship with coming here and stuff like yeah. that, but like. Well, he's still terrified of the first game. Yeah, it is like, what it he, is. He goes on the bed and whines and cries. It's not bad. No, yeah, I get it. He's not bite him or anything. He knows. Yeah. You know? So, you know, it's interesting. So like, we'll see, let's say with dogs that do one-on-ones, board and trains we don't see this as much with because we really, 
put a lot of emphasis with at least the board and trains them trying to have a good relationship with everything through the socialization and all that. But with like one-on-ones, sometimes we have to rush through things a little bit more and we get to use a little bit more pressure on the dogs and stuff like that. And um, you know, they'll kind of be like nervous coming here and stuff. And the first couple times they board, it's kind of the same deal. They're like, uh, I don't know about this place. Yeah. But it's funny, like once they do the boarding and once we have them like under control and we have them at a place where it's like, you know, they're not reacting, they're not acting out and stuff like that. That's when all the fun shit happens. You get to socialize every day. You get to go for walks. You get to do really easy training sessions. Like, that's the thing that I feel like last at Center, they're, they're right at what they do. Sure. They're very structured. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. they need to. Yeah, they got a small place, you know, I get it. So. Structure. Um, I know he does some vet stays. Do yeah. Talk to them and everything. But mm -hmm. then he's a very dog social dog. Sure. Uh, and he doesn't get that across canine. You yeah. know, he likes smuggling with people. He doesn't sure. really get that across canine. You know, he likes yeah. um, going, you know, yeah, I understand. being able to, you know, do all that stuff. Yeah. He really doesn't <clears throat> get that sort of interaction that yeah. he really craves. And like that's really what gets him out of the shell. And, sure. Like, responds better. Yep. I gotcha. But they also need to have accountability. Like these people will shit that. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's give and take, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's one of those things where initially, so, you know, we used to uh, we used to be much more like on just like the just strict and controlled side of things with things as well. But it's one of those things where like you were saying, like there are some dogs that like, yeah, they need to just like have some fun with doing some things, yeah. like, right? He's done so much better. <clears throat> yeah. And is such so more well-behaved if he's like, people call it bluff. Like, sure. No, you're, of course. You're fine, let's go. Yeah. And he's like, oh shoot. It, it's all about having a balance for it, yeah. you know, so. Um, questions, any questions you got? No, you pretty much covered everything I needed. If yeah. you were asking me questions I didn't know I needed to ask myself, which I think is the most important part. Listen, you know, I, I, I push just, I, I try to push just where I need to push, you know? And sometimes it's like, what do you mean? You know what I mean? Like, but it's like, we gotta get to the bottom of it. <laughs> so. I mean, listen, like, I think for you, honestly, um, I think doing stuff like this is going to be better than something like that. Yeah, well, I'm going to um, you know, Good Dog in New Orleans. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, I'm going there for a week. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is working with shelter dogs. Sure. Um, I've had a lot of bites. So, yeah. Um, a lot of redirections, a lot of that sort of stuff. <laughs> when, are you going, when are you going to this program? Uh, June 12th or 18th. Oh, it's coming up real soon. Yeah. So, so Sean is cool. I like Sean, right? Um, when I first got into dog training, <laughs> man, mine's a little bit louder than yours. Sorry. I know. Sorry, it's gonna bother you. Um, yeah, when I first started getting into dog training, obviously Sean's been around for a long time. Like I did a couple like phone consults with him and stuff like that, and and he was very, like, he was a very essential part of when I first got into training and like helping me learn some like really key things. The only thing I kind of not warn people about, but just prepare them for a little bit if they're going to do any sort of like training with him, because I work with a lot of like younger trainers and stuff, is. There's gonna be things you see him do from a training standpoint that aren't gonna make that much sense to you because he's got a program and it works great for him and it works for his clients and stuff like that. I think that Sean is a little limited as far as his deep understanding of like the whys behind some of the training. It's kind of like the it's worked for me and it does work but I don't think he really understands deeply why some of the things right. are working. You know what I mean? Exactly, right? Uh, and obviously, like, he's an e-collar training. He really has pioneered a lot of e-collar techniques that people use to this day, right? So it's, it's good. It's, it's great, obviously. Um, but it's very, the training is very contingent on the e. You know what I mean? Like, like a lot of this kind of stuff and things like that. Like, it's very much like the e-collar is the training yeah. there. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think I mentioned briefly, you know, I worked at Boston. Yep. And it really knocked my confidence in me ever being able to work with dogs ever again. Sure. And so now I'm just trying to branch out to different places. Yeah. Do I have what it takes? Like, am I crazy? Yeah. Like, or is it just I need to find my own way that works? Yeah. I. I think that's a lot of it, you know? I think there, there's like this like new wave of dog trainers out there right now that I find like, just like find a trainer, right? Or a couple trainers and they do, I call it like trainer hopping, right? Like they'll like hop on the bandwagon of like 
Sean the Good Dog, and then they'll hop on the bandwagon of Jeff Gelman, and then they'll hop on the bandwagon of Larry Crone, and then they'll hop on the bandwagon of Tyler Mudo and Michael Ellison, and this and that. And it's like they kind of just go from like, I'm just gonna do everything this person says, then I'm gonna do everything this person says, then I'm gonna do everything this person says, but they like never hit a point where it's like they create their own thing. You know what I mean? Like at some point you have to step away from that, and be like, okay, cool. I've learned why you guys do all of the things that, the way you do them. Now I'm gonna pick and choose what I like and what I don't like, yeah. right? And uh, I think that's a very, very important, you know, it's an important process to learn all of those different things as long as you're doing it with the open mind of like, you know, like none of this, even what I'm telling you, you know what I mean? Like none of this is like the end all be all with anything. It's not like, you know, like there's plenty of people that'll look at the shit that I do and be like, yeah, well, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. It's like, that's fine, right? Like I have these things, I have my program set up in a way that works for me. Sean has a program set up in a way that works for him, et cetera, et cetera. And who are we to say like, this is right, this is wrong, but you have to create what's good for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the biggest so. thing is I have it so jumpy around the other dogs because I'm in a shelter. Sure. Because they don't have safety protocols. They do yep. they do. Oh, of course. You know? yeah, yeah. But it's almost just like, can I get past that? Yeah. And, yeah. And they, they've got some behavior dogs. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and you, yeah, and it's 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 one of those things where you're you're doing the correct thing by like educating yourself and like learning as much as possible, obviously. Yeah. Um, some of that kind of stuff. It's interesting. Like we talk about it when it comes to like the first time you see a dog fight, right? The first time you get bit by a dog, right? Any of those types of things are really key learning opportunities and you could either let them crush you or you could learn so much from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, a part of it is just like, you know, especially if you're working with like, you know, like we work with behavioral modification here also, right? We get a lot of dogs that come in that are big bite risks and, <laughs> and, and stuff like that, right? And, and it's like, you know, you have to be, respectful and hyper aware of like these are possibilities and you have to force yourself to just slow down a little bit when you're doing it right and 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 just not do rash things and just be constantly in tune with the animal that you're working with yeah. you know like and it's hard right like it's so much easier said than done exactly. yeah yeah because all my experience sure don't have safety yeah yeah puzzles, you know yeah It's a lot of guilt built on because yeah. I, I'm one of the, like the senior volunteers there, so I'm always pressured to be doing the behavior ones. Even sure, I'm, sure. I know that dog doesn't like me. You're going to want me to go in there. Yeah. I'm going to get big. That dog's going to have a bite history. We are still trying to yeah. be like, Even stuff like that, right? Like. Like that's where it's like, especially if you're the senior person there, right? Like that's that's gonna be, that's up to you to start like looking at like, wait, like if this is a situation that there's even a remote possibility I'm gonna get bit, I need to do something different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like you shouldn't be putting yourself in a position where it's like, I'm gonna do this and there's like a 75% chance I get bit right now. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's how it is. Yeah, it's like it's like you got to figure out alternatives. It's it's kind of the same as uh, you know, like when we get dogs in and if they hide themselves in the back of the kennel or in the crate or this or that, it's like we have numerous ways that we can approach that situation in a safe manner, right? Even stuff as simple as like I did a lesson the other day or a couple weeks ago with our Rottweiler, like had like human aggression issues, right? Yeah, right? is he? That's funny. So, so um, you know, the dog was kind of like just able to like slip his lower jaw like out of the muzzle. And, and I was like, you know, like if I do the things I normally do, like I'm gonna get bit in this situation. And we have a bite sleeve, right? So I was able to put the bite sleeve on, work him like normal and stuff like that. And if he did slip it, I knew I wasn't gonna get bit in that situation, right? Same deal, approaching kennels. We had this dog, Kevin, in a couple months ago. Actually, probably, it was quite a while ago at this point, but. Yeah, that was like December. He was here in December, yeah. Um, time just like moves like non-existently to me. <laughs> and you know, Kevin would park himself in the back crane, crazy fear aggressive, would snap, growl, bite, this, that, right? Like, and, and like you're gonna get, you're gonna get hit like if he, if he gets you, right? Same deal, right? We were able to read the situation and be like, okay, cool. If, you know, he's typically gonna retreat, but once he hits that point where he's all the way against the corner, that's where he starts snapping, right? So I was able to do a double approach with him where had the bite sleeve on, I was able to go in, I had a slip lead that I made like basically like a freaking lasso, right? So I can kind of block him with the bite sleeve and slip that leash over his head. And then I knew as soon as I got him out of there, I was good, right? So that was how I prevented myself from getting bit in that situation. You just gotta get creative with it. But the first step is just slow the fuck down. And just like, if you even think there's a possibility you're gonna get bit in that situation, you need to just stop for a minute and be like, 
what creative approach can I come up with to make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah. You know what I mean? You mentioned like clip leashes. There is absolutely no reason why, if you're concerned this dog's gonna be a bite risk, that you ever use a clip leash yeah, with them. Yeah, and sometimes no. the dog tours will get them out, can't come back in, he's looks in the kennel, and mm -hmm. the kennel possessive, and it's like, get the dog out. Mm -hmm. like, there's been so many times where I clip them outside of the kennel and then shove them in the kennel. Sure, yeah, yeah. And they're in the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and then it's like, you know, and then it's like, okay, say they put a clip leash on him, right, or a regular leash clipped to his collar, right, and it's like, you get him back in, and then you're like, well, shit, it looks like he might bite me if I try to take this off. Then you just kind of chalk up your loss. You're like, well, I'm not taking the leash off then, right? Sorry, dude, it's staying in there with you. And if you chew it up, oh well, right? But like, that that's really, I, I think like that's where the experience really comes into play is like just being able to just slow down and look at that situation and just be like, like getting bit is not an option right now. You know what I mean? And like knock on wood, right? Wherever we got wood here. Like I've only really been bitten one time, right? And that time that I got bit was 100% my fault. It was a situation where I rushed too quickly into things. I didn't put in place those safety rules. I didn't take my own advice. You know what I mean? And I got bit for it. And it was like, it happened and I was like, oh shit, like that sucks, right? So I got a big scar on my hand from it, and it's like that sucks. I don't want that to happen again, I've been, right? I've been lucky there's nothing serious. Yeah. I've had a dog actually bite my neck before. Well, that's not good. We don't want that to happen ever. No. But this is what I mean, like you know, like and again, especially work. Yeah. Working with behavioral modification and stuff like that, right? I see the absolute worst of the worst situations, right? Like I see dogs that literally will kill you. You know what I mean? And I think that especially in the shelter system and stuff like that, I think some people, whether it's, you, you know, their heart is so good with it, right? Like I get it, right? But I think that they could be a little oblivious to the fact that that exists. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we look at it, it's like, oh, he bit, something bad probably happened to him, this, that. It's like, no, there's some dogs out there that just want to kill you. And, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and that's why you, you absolutely cannot even have me getting bit as an option. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because again, you make that mistake with the wrong dog, you, it could get very, very right, bad. It's going to be a little dip on the hand. You know what I mean? So, so you have to approach every single dog kind of like that with those yeah. types of things. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a lot. I mean, you know, like, like I said, I, I don't envy people's situation that are in yours where it's like, you know, they're working in the shelter and stuff like that because I get how hard it is. You know, I do. I do yeah, understand I that, obviously. I don't judge them, but so. they just don't have safety <clears throat> protocols in yeah. place and they only do peer positive training, yeah. and, you know, and that's what's mm -hmm. stopping you. You just work with what you got. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's where the creativity comes in. Work with what you got. Yeah, and, and accepting just the individual responsibility. Like, you know, right? Like, uh, whatever, the place you work at, you know they're not gonna make those changes right now, yeah. right? It's just not, they got bigger things to worry about, right? Um, so it's up to the individual person to make those changes, right? Like, when you're handling dogs, you are gonna take this approach with things, yeah. right? And that has nothing to do with, nothing to do with training. Right. It just has to do with how you're, sa the safety you are putting in place for yourself, yeah. right?